question, Basilius. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me share screen first. How is it working? Good, I can see. Yes, it's okay. Good. Great. Um, let me oops, press the wrong button. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hei Young No uh, from Stanford University. So today I will uh, give a talk about this new concept called structures as sensors, where we use the ambient structural responses to indirectly monitor humans and surrounding environments. Um, yeah, so these days our daily life heavily depends on large scale civil infrastructure systems like buildings, uh, bridges, and various transportation systems. And we're continuously physically interacting with these structures. So by making these structures smarter, we can take various benefits from it. Uh, for example, we can better understand the structural state uh, and then uh, improve the safety of the structural system by preventing any catastrophic failures or reducing the accidents. Uh, in addition, by better understanding the human occupants in the building or the surrounding environment, we can improve the quality of life of the occupants by, for example, providing more personalized services, improving their healthcare services or security system, or doing a general environmental monitoring to reduce the impact um, of uh, the humans or the built, in, uh, built environment to the environment. And to achieve these goals, we need to instrument sensors on these structures, like putting a lot of sensors on the bridges or the road system, railway systems, or um, cameras, or uh, these uh, RFID. Just like this, Looks simple enough. However, it's actually not a trivial task to instrument our infrastructure systems due to various reasons. Uh, for example, many of the infrastructure systems we deal with are large in scale and very complex, which makes it very expensive to put together these monitoring systems. Second of all, uh, there's a huge mismatch between the lifetime of the sensors and the lifetime of the infrastructure. Um, anyone familiar with the typical lifespan of sensor systems? So easy example will be thinking about how often you change your phone, because your phone has a lot of sensors in it. Usually a couple of years and maybe for a good five years. And I've seen some people maintaining for 10 years. Okay, so that's about the scale. What about the lifespan of the buildings or bridges that we design? Typical design life, 50 years, 100 years. Sometimes if you go to different countries, you see some thousand year old buildings standing there too. So that's a different scale there which means we need a frequent updating of the sensing system and uh, the software in it as well, which makes the monitoring system even more expensive. And a uh, third reason here I have is we uh, often uh, need a more complex information or there's no direct uh, the sensor that give you directly give you the answer uh, you want. For example, is there a sensor that directly tells you what's the damage state of the structure? Or is there a sensor that tells you directly how healthy or happy people are in this structure? So that means we need to instrument many different types of sensors and interpret the results in order to relate the sensor recording to the answer we want. So this will require seriously more expensive monitoring system to get to the desired information. Um, so in this regard, my group has been working on answering the question of how can we sense everything in a more maintainable way? And to answer this question, we've been developing this concept called the structures as sensors. So to explain this concept, let me give you an example. For example, like in a microphone, uh, uh, one of the typical sensors, 
uh, when we talk about physical component of this sensor, we are referring to this small diaphragm inside the microphone that vibrates as the sound wave comes in. So it's responding to the excitation source that we're interested in sensing and it's transferred to the electrical signal. Um, similarly, now instead of using a small diaphragm, we're gonna use the entire building structure or entire transportation structure uh, system as a physical component of, of sensor. So it's receiving the information coming from the structure itself or the humans, uh, human users or the surrounding environment, and then transfer it to the electrical signal to interpret their the sensing target information. So let me give you a more detailed uh, framework of structures as sensors approach. So we have these physical structural systems like the vehicle transportation systems or the buildings. And their structural responses depends on the structural characteristics of themselves, which is like the stiffness, what's the damping, what's the natural frequency and so on. Uh, but they also depend on the activities of the human users and okay, people are, Walking around in the building that creates structural responses. If they're dancing, jumping, that also creates different vibration responses in the structure. And of course, these structural responses also depend on the environmental condition, what's the temperature, what's the wind, uh, if there's an earthquake, or what's the what's the surrounding infrastructure that these transportation systems are running on. So all these different factors are affecting these structures to respond. Uh, so from these structural responses, we collect the data and transfer into the electrical signal. And from those signal or the data, we extract the features, which will be put it into the learning system to extract the sensing target information that we want. It looks like problem solved. We propose the structures as sensors approach. It's much easier to sense all these different types of information from just the structural responses. However, there's never free lunch. It turns out that we need a lot of data to achieve these structures as sensors goal. Because um, if you think about it, it's uh, both blessing and curse that there's a lot of information embedded into the structural responses. It's multiple sources of excitations all combined together within this noisy vibration responses. So that means in order to decompose all this information and understand the sensing target information, we need to have a lot of data. And then we learned that every structure is unique. Many of them are designed differently. Even if they're designed in the same way, they're constructed differently and they're sitting on a different climate zone, they are being used differently. So that eventually this structure develops into a different unique um, structure. Uh, so in order to understand all these differences and different structures, uh, we need to have even more data. And then a lot of interesting events that we want to detect, like critical structural damage happening or critical events happening to the humans to, to improve their quality of life. Many of them are very rarely occurring events. So in order to collect enough incidences of this interesting event, we need to have seriously more amount of data. But if you guys work in the experimental area, we all know that it's very hard and expensive to collect a lot of real world data. For example, here I'm showing um, uh, the bridge house monitoring um, experiment we did before. So on, on the, the two photos on the right hand side shows a couple of my students. So we were doing the railway bridge monitoring in Pittsburgh uh, when I was at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and so to do this experiment, we were only allowed to be on the bridge between 1 a.m. and 6 a.m. because that's the time that the light rail system stopped operation for night. Uh, so we went there for one weekend and then instrumented the bridge with the sensors. We also drove two trains out to create a traffic condition for this train to drive back and forth and back and forth. Uh, and then collected the bridge vibration responses. Uh, so one night, we spent the whole night doing this, but collected only 20 samples of it. 
So by running it two nights, we only ended up with 40, 50 um, data samples. And that was it. Like three people spending the entire weekend, only 50 samples. So imagine trying to collect da uh, data from this bridge and inducing different damage conditions and in all different temperature and traffic condition and trying to collect enough samples, like thousand samples. That's gonna take a lot of time to do it. How about a human example, asking a person to walk around in a building a thousand different times, wearing different shoes, walking in different speed. Can you imagine it's gonna be a lot of effort? And what if this is your grandma? Definitely don't want to do that, ask her to do that. So this high dimensional problem with the small data is a fundamental challenge uh, when we deal with machine learning problems in the real world. So in addition to the first research problem on how can we sense everything, uh, we've been also working on the second problem of how can we understand the output coming out of structures and sensor system with minimal data requirement. And with that regard, uh, we've been working on the developing physics guided learning approaches. So this approach, in addition to the structures and sensors framework, we uh, combine the various models based on the domain knowledge or physical understanding of our system, such as structural response modeling, not only how the structural uh, system actually responds to different excitation sources, how the wave propagates in this structural medium, and the sensing target models, like how human behaves usually, how, what's the environmental property that changes over time, and all these different components in this framework are informed by the physical knowledge or domain knowledge. And then different models are combined as physics guided learning approach, which will learn the sensing target information. And this extracted sensing target information will be fed back into the data acquisition system to improve the sensing configuration or uh, fed back into the structural system and the human system to actually improve the uh, structural state or quality of life of people. So to explain this overall concept and show, the, show you through the real world examples, I will first um, show this through, the, uh, through a vehicle as sensors project, one of the project, ongoing projects in my lab where we use the vehicles or to be specific, trains as sensors to monitor the track and bridge systems. So maintaining rail tracks and railway system is a challenging task due to its large scale. So many current practice to maintain rail tracks involve uh, a lot of human reporting and the visual inspection by the engineers. We can imagine it can be very labor intensive and costly, and also it's uh, human based, so it tends to be subjective. So, our research community has been working hard to develop uh, more direct monitoring or non destructive evaluation methods to monitor these uh, large scale rail, ne rail network. Uh, so, for example, we'll put sensors on these tracks to monitor the track health or we even have these dedicated bogies instrumented with a lot of sensors and it can run at night or in between the train operations. Just run on the, um, slowly go through the track to inspect those track uh, system. So it's more automated way, more objective way to monitor the tracks, but it's very expensive both to install and maintain considering the scale of the rail network. So to address some of these issues, uh, a group has been developing Thomas the Tank Engine. But the idea is uh, these regular operational trains uh, go through or travel through this rail network every day, even multiple times a day. Um, so why don't we make these trains smarter so they can, as they travel, uh, they can go and collect the information about the infrastructure. So basically, we are using these vehicles, the vehicle structure, 
as sensors to collect data about the infrastructure. So they can diagnose damage on the roads, railways, and bridges, all these surrounding infrastructures around this vehicle system using only the onboard sensing system during the regular operation. So there's no other extra sensors needed outside these vehicles. So here in the bottom figure shows the overall framework. So these trains are instrumented with vibration sensors. And as it's traveling across different infrastructure, it's continuously collecting the vehicle vibration responses due to induced due to the interaction with the surrounding environment. So from these vibration responses, we put put it into the classification system. And when there's any anomaly detected, uh, in other words, when there's any potential damage detected, the information is sent to the transportation authority to uh, send out some people to further inspect the, the suspected area. Um, but again, there's never free lunch. Now it's a lot simpler and easier to collect the data, but we found that these train vibration responses depend on many different excitation sources. One is infrastructure conditions like the track roughness or any damage happening to it, which we want to detect. But also the other uh, sources like operational conditions like train speed. If the train runs at different speed, even if the track condition is exactly same, we're gonna see a different train vibration responses. Also the train vibration response depends on the train properties like the mass or stiffness, which may change depending on what time of the day the train's running, like rush hour versus non-rush hour, or as um, the, say the suspension system wears out over time, which will change the stiffness uh, um, of the system inside. So given that there are many different factors that's affecting the response of the train that we're collecting, modeling all these variation variables into consideration for, for analyzing the area could be one solution, but it's very difficult if impossible uh, because of the very ill-posed nature of the problem. So refer to uh, decompose the signal and then trying to understand the track profile or damage state of the track based on the vehicle responses. There are too many unknowns in this equation. So it becomes highly ill post inverse problem. So to address this challenge, we started making some observations. So one of the observations we made is that the trains suspension is mostly activated by uh, only a few major bumps, like joints and switch gear that exist uh, regularly or normally into this train system, as well as um, uh, abnormal bumps like defects that we want to detect. And given that there are only a few bumps that are causing some major, uh, major excitation into the train excitation, train vibration responses, we can make an assumption like the signal sparsity in the track profile that corresponds to each of these sparsely located bumps. And then the second observation we made is that the train's fundamental mode tend to dominate the response of the train. So we can simplify, simplify the dynamics of the train to uh, uh, so something like single degree of freedom system. Uh, and then we put these assumptions together and formulate the overall track profile estimation problem into an optimization problem, like shown here. So due to the time limit, I won't go into the details, but we're basically trying to minimize the discrepancy between the predicted response of the train and the measured train response subjected to the constraints mentioned above. So, to show how well this method works, we actually did an evaluation through the collaboration with the Port Authority of Allegheny County in Pittsburgh. So here the picture shows one of the trains that we instrumented uh, in the light rail train. So we first started this experiment in 2013 um, 
And we went and inspected the train to see where would be a nice place to put our sensors to, in, um, to use this train as sensors, we put a system together uh, and then instrumented it. And since then, since the fall 2013, it's been uh, continuously collecting the data up until when the COVID started. So, so far we have about six and a half years of data. And if any of you guys are interested in looking into the data set and do further analysis, we actually open source the data set uh, called the Dr. Train data set, a dynamic response of the train data set on this website. So feel free to go check it out yourself. Um, just to show you the scale of the project, this shows a two by nine kilometer Google map uh, with the train trajectory on top of it. And here's a quick result. So um, on the left-hand side, I'm showing the raw signal of 145 trains uh, passes. So x-axis is the position of the uh, train. So you see that it's uh, over the 50 meter uh, track segment. Y-axis shows the acceleration, um, meaning basically the vertical vibration of the train as it was traveling. And you see there are 145 different runs and all these signals very noisy. And also uh, all the signals look very different from each other due to the random noise and the high level of noise in the signal. So it's very difficult to compare these signals from each other and trying to see when the damage has happened or when the signal characteristics has changed. On the other hand, on the right hand side, it shows the, uh, the signal that went through our method, our optimization method. And then we extracted only the major um, bumps or the train response due to the major bumps uh, extracted. So now we also align the signal according to the bump location. Well, I'll correct it. Uh, and see that most of the noise is gone due to the sparse approximation method. Uh, and then signals look a lot like each other. So it's much easier to compare them to each other and pick out when the change has happened. Okay. And based on these features, we made, um, we were able to detect the damage up to 92% accuracy. And then because there was a train dynamics incorporated into that optimization problem, we were also able to further characterize uh, the damage based on the amplitude and the change pattern of those uh, features. Uh, so for example, we can locate the damage and quantify how much track change has happened at what time uh, by making physical interpretation. And it's also robust to different trains and op different train conditions and operational conditions. So more recently, we've been expanding this work to go from the train system to car system uh, to do a bridge monitoring of any regular road, uh, the, the car traffic bridges. So here on the photo, I'm showing a Coyote Creek Bridge in San Jose in California. It's a three-span concrete bridge. And we put sensors, uh, accelerometers in the car so as the cars passing by these bridges or even the regular road system, uh, we look at how the car vibrates uh, by through the interaction with the roads as well as interaction with the bridge system and then extract our bridge um, signature out of that vibration responses. So here we're also combining the car vibration sensing with the fiber optic cable that's, in, uh, that's installed on the bridge for the telecommunication purposes. So this is a regular internet or phone cables um, that exist in the city. And we're turning them into distributed acoustic sensors because this some, there are some dark cables in this cable bundles. And then we can inject some signal into it and see, look at the reflection to use it as a vibration sensor. Uh, we're at the beginning stage of this uh, project. And now those, some of the preliminary results show very promising, uh, promising results. 
that these telecommunication cables actually could be turned into a sensing system to monitor bridge. It's a non-dedicated sensing system that will help uh, assessing the bridge condition uh, in with, uh, when it's combined with our uh, vehicle sensing system. So here in this figure shows that uh, the similar frequency spectrum pattern has been observed between the uh, uh, between the bridge vibration sensor data as well as the, uh, the distributed acoustic sensing with it with the optical cables. You see that uh, we identified the bridge resonant frequency around 4.6, 6.4, and 8.9 hertz. And then we also extracted some more shapes from the telecommunication cable as well as the accelerometer data. And we found very similar patterns between these two modalities. Uh, so the next step will be combining these different modalities to come up with a more accurate um, characterization of the bridge and detecting the damage happening to the bridge. Okay, so that was an example of using vehicles as structures to um, extract the features based on the physics-based model as well as the data-driven models. And just to show you the generalizability of this structures as sensors concept, I'm going to introduce another example that's using the building structures as sensors. So vehicle vibration sensing has been widely used among the structural engineers and civil engineers uh, because it contains a lot of information about the dynamic characters, characteristics of the structures as well as the input excitation. And it's been used a lot for structural health monitoring purposes to diagnose damage or predict the damage or do a various serviceability analysis. But then we also found, uh, actually there's a story to it. So when we were do, we instrumented a building and then collect the vi ambient vibration response of the building to um, do a health monitoring or, or building characterization. It was one night we were doing experiment and my PhD student actually said, um, oh, we should do the experiment at night because that's when it's quiet and not many like machineries or the humans are causing noise to our uh, data. So we were doing the experiment at night, but then there were a few people who were left in, this is a campus building, left there working hard at night. So one guy actually came out of his office and he walked to the bathroom. So I told my student, oh, let's stop the experiment just a little bit. Uh, and we can resume whenever he comes out. Uh, a little bit later, he came out of the bathroom. So I said, oh, okay, now let's resume the experiment. And then my student told me, hey, you know what? He didn't wash his hands in the bathroom. I was like, what? How do you know? You know that he, it was a female student I was working with, so she said, um, oh, I was looking at the oscilloscope screen um, while we stopped the experiment. I saw small impulses when he was walking by. And then he opened the door, went in and small impulses. And then it was quiet for a while. And then a little later, it's like, Shoo! he did his business and flushed. And then small impulses, small impulses, open the door and there was a bigger impulse, 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 and he went back to his office. So it was like, there was no time or the signal that indicated that he washed his hands. And we're like, oh, that's very interesting. It's actually our, the structural vibration we're measuring is not just about the building characteristics, but it also contains information about human activities and it can be quite detailed. So that's when we started looking into this problem more and then figured that we can extract a lot of human occupant information through their activity induced, or specifically we looked at footstep induced floor vibration. So this way we're sensing occupant information through the structures. So there are several advantages compared to other modality of sensing humans. There's no need for any humans to carry a device. 
a lot less privacy concern compared to something like camera or audio system. And it's very non-intrusive and minimal interference to human activities. Here's an example of the data we collected by putting a sensor on the floor. So we're looking at the floor vibration response to human activity. You can see that in this figure, x-axis is time, y-axis is the vertical velocity of the floor response. And each of the impulses correspond to individual footfalls. And you can see the amplitude is going up as the person was approaching the sensor. And as the person passes by the sensor and walk away from the sensor, the amplitude is decaying. The basic ideas here are the sensors. We use the geophones to measure the velocity of the floor. And as a person walks in, each footstep creates a wave that will propagate and hit the sensor at different time with different waveform. So by combining these um, signals together, we were able to find out who they were, um, where they were and what kind of activities they're doing and even their health status or cognitive status. Because when you're happy and excited versus when you're sad or tired, the walking pattern changes. Now here's a video showing the data collected. So top figure shows the, the time domain signal and the bottom figure shows the frequency Play the video again. Uh, yes, yeah, so the bottom figure, the colorful figure shows the corresponding frequency response of the signal. And red boxes means that our system has detected the signal as a human induced footstep signal. Okay. So once, it, once the data gets streamed in, um, this detecting footstep versus non footstep is a straightforward classification problem. If you have enough baseline data, we can differentiate between first step versus other, other uh, impulsive events like dropping an object or slamming a door or, or dragging a chair. So we can differentiate that. And once we detect humans' first steps, we can do various analysis. One of the things we did was identify people. We learned that everyone walks in a different way. We have two, two students walking here. On the left-hand side is Carlos, our PhD student. On the right-hand side is Ning Ning, one of our master's students. So Carlos is very busy. He, he has a lot of deadlines and the professors are asking for meetings. So he's always in a hurry. And if you look at the way he walks, you see his center of gravity is kept center or almost forward. Whereas Ning Ning is a very relaxed person. She just finished her final exam and she also got a job offer. And so she's like happy and nothing's, nothing's hurting her. So if you look at the way she walks, her center of gravity is tapped backward. And that different posture also causes how their foot hits the floor. See, Carlos has very small angle between his foot and the floor. Whereas Ning Ning has very large angle between her foot and the floor. Uh, so it creates more stomping kind of action when she's walking. So all these differences are reflected in the signal that we collected. So top row shows Carlos's signal, bottom row shows the Ning Ning signal. You see that Ning Ning has a lot sharper peak and then it decays quickly because it's more like an impact load where Carlos had a lot smoother uh, first step signal. So it's a smaller peak and decays also slower. So all these different things and also the frequency response of the, these collective first step signals um, show the different features. So we extract, the, extract them out and put it into classification system and it can differentiate different people based on their first step induced floor vibration signal. Uh, so we recruited more people. So with 10 people, we collected 10 traces per person and um, did the analysis. And it turns out the result is that when we try to classify whose first step it is among the 10 people, we achieve about 90% accuracy if we do it for every first step. So that's shown as a blue curve and the plot in the middle. 
Whereas, uh, but no one has just one single first step and then disappears. So there is a sequence of first steps. So by combining a, a, a whole trace of first step, which contains about seven, eight first steps together, we were able to achieve up to 99% accuracy. Uh, that's shown in the orange curve in the plot. So X axis here is the number of uh, traces used for training. So of course, if we use more number of traces for training, then the accuracy improves. And Y axis shows the, uh, the accuracy. So we're all excited. 99% accuracy is pretty good. We can differentiate 10 people just using the building vibration data. Uh, so we're going to go publish our students all excited. But then uh, I asked them, OK, just to make sure this results very good. But let's let's uh, come back tomorrow and do repeat the same experiment to see how it works out. So next day, this location wasn't available so we moved to uh, we moved to upstairs and then we tested and the results dropped to 20 percent now what happened everyone was kind of confused and depressed now the results dropped down a lot so it turned out that uh, when we moved from one location to another location in this case we went upstairs to do the experiment because we're sensing humans through the structural responses, this uh, data we're collecting are structure dependent, of course, meaning even if it's the same person walking, the data distribution shifts if we move from one structure to another structure, or if the structural configuration changes even within the same building. This means we need to calibrate and retrain the model whenever we move to a different structure or a different location in the structure sometimes, which is very um, time consuming and basically impractical. Uh, it turns out that it's the identification was 20%, but even detecting whether it's first step human induced vibration versus non-human induced vibration, that dif differentiating or detecting the human uh, dropped down to 63% from 99% accuracy. So we can't even tell whether it's first step or not. So um, to address this problem and to avoid having to recalibrate and retrain at every single location, uh, we developed the new physics guided learning approach. So basically we came up with the idea of model transform that's informed by the structural characteristics. So in this case, we're going to have a few number of source structures, which contains a lot of available uh, label data. Uh, but then instead of retraining or recreating the model when we move to a new location, we're going to update or modify this existing um, models trained from the source structure so that it can be used in the new set of structures called target structures. And we won't require the target structures to have label data. Okay. So the basic idea is, I'm going to explain it in terms of differentiating human first step versus all the other excitation. So in one location, if we collect the data correspond to first step versus all the others, they're going to create two different distributions. And there's a difference between them because they are caused by different excitations. So this is called the excitation effect. Uh, but then both of these distribution belong to one distribution uh, called the source structure data distribution. And then let's move to a different location or different structure and collect the data for the structure uh, for the first step and the other excitation. And it's going to be a different uh, different distribution here. It's a gray blob shown in the figure. So that's a target structure data. And then there's a difference between this orange blob and the gray blob due to the different structure effect. So our goal here is we're going to look for a new feature space that we're going to project these two data distribution into so that the structural effect is minimized. So we're basically looking for this projection matrix W, where in the new space, this orange blob and the gray blob will be close to each other. 
And this can be formulated into an optimization problem again. Uh, so I won't go into the details, but we are trying to minimize, we're, we're trying to look for W, the projection matrix, which will minimize the structural effect, the distance between the two blocks, uh, uh, while uh, also minimizing the regularization term to reduce the effect of noise and also uh, we have a distribution shape preserving term to prevent the solution to go into a trivial solution, such that we also maintain the label information so that the data, even in the transferred feature space, they are separable from each other. And after solving that optimization problem, we will find the W matrix, which will transform the feature from original feature space to the new space where the structural effect is minimized. So we can reuse the model trained from the source domain uh, data to the new target domain data. So we uh, collected uh, data set from three different buildings to test out this method. Uh, and here's the results. So each column, uh, actually there are three, uh, three columns, Baptist, Porter, and Vincentian, which represent three different buildings. Uh, the Baptist column means that we use the Baptist, uh, Baptist nursing home building as the test structure, uh, whereas they use the other two as the source structure. And Porter means Porter was the target structure and the other two were the source structure and same for the Vincentian. And the green bar represents the accuracy of our approach, the model transfer approach, whereas the blue and the red bars correspond to other conventional method that doesn't incorporate the model transfer approach. So you can see that using our approach, the green bar achieved up to 99% accuracy, whereas non-model transfer approaches uh, will achieve only, to, only from 60 to 80% percent accuracy. So it, model transfer was able to improve the accuracy significantly, even when we're moving from one structure to another structure. Um, so just to summarize what else we could do, we're able to identify person with up to 99% accuracy. And we're also able to localize the occupants uh, with up to 0.2 meter accuracy. And even when there are multiple people walking together, we were able to count and locate individual person uh, separately with similar uh, accuracy results. And more recently, we've been working on characterizing the, the person's activities and the health conditions. And, and for various projects, we achieved up to 92 to 95% accuracy for differentiating different everyday activities like cooking or vacuuming, cleaning, uh, and so on, and the, uh, trying to estimate the health status of people and correlating their gait pattern to different disease states. Um, and currently, my students are working on extracting more sophisticated gait parameters and ground reaction forces and from the vibration data. So just quickly, let's see how, uh, so based on these different characteristics or the measures we can extract from the building vibration data, what can we do a higher level understanding? And one of the projects we're working on currently is through the collaboration with the Nationwide Children's Hospital, we're monitoring patients with muscular dystrophy. So this is a neuromuscular disease often shown to the boys in Amish community, also outside Amish community as well. So this is a disease that um, causes people to, um, people have hard time regenerating their muscles. So when you go exercise, next day you may feel painful because your muscle breaks down, but then soon they will regenerate. And, and then when it regenerates, your muscle gets thicker and bigger. And that's how you grow your muscle. But if you have muscular dystrophy, you cannot do that. So you're slowly just losing your muscle, starting from bigger muscles, usually the leg muscles, and eventually you lose your respiratory system. And that's the end uh, that usually uh, you, you can't live um, anymore. 
So typical life expectancy for these patients about 20 years old. Uh, but if you um, get packed and put them into right treatment and early on, you can elongate their lifespan up to 50%, so about 30 years old. So we're working with the medical doctors trying to understand the patient's state, states through their gait pattern because leg muscle is one of the first muscle they lose. So we're looking at their walking ability, how far they can walk, what's the walking speed, uh, do they have regular heel toe motions when they walk, how tired or how balanced are they uh, when they are walking and so on, and then correlate that to their disease status. And one of the benefit of this, uh, our sensing modality is it's a continuous monitoring that we can do at home. So we can inform the doctors and caregivers of continuous health status of the patient. So a photo here shows my student, Jonathan, explaining to one of the Amish boys so uh, what kind of experiment we're doing. And we, this is their community center because that was the only place that has power in their village. So here's a quick result. Um, so x-axis shows different methods we use. Y-axis uses the prediction accuracy of this disease. So using the various symptom-based features, we were able to achieve up to 86% up to accuracy. Uh, if we combine all these symptom-based features, we got up to 90% accuracy. Uh, and if we use purely signal-based uh, data-driven approach, we got 83% accuracy. But then if we do a physics-guided data-driven approach and then combine with the structural, re structural effect reduction method that we developed, then we were able to achieve up to 96% accuracy. So it shows the, the power of combining both the physical domain knowledge as well as the data-driven approach and the importance of um, reducing the structural effect from our data set. Uh, so there are various related results of projects that uses structures as sensors. For example, we have animal health monitoring project, uh, just like children, these animals also, when they walk around, they create vibration on the structures. So by looking at that, we can figure out what kind of activities they're doing, how often are they feeding, how often are they nursing, is there any fights between the animals, social interaction between the animals and so on to, to help the farmers better uh, maintain um, their, their animals. Uh, we've been also working with the elder care facilities to monitor the gait pattern of these elderly residents uh, and then we're trying to predict their fall hazard uh, which could cause a very severe injury or sometimes death for the elderly residents and then of course we're also working on monitoring human activities like hand washing using the vibration sensing system so in summary We've been working on two um, big research questions. The first one is how can we sense everything in a more maintainable way? And we propose the idea called the structures as sensors to um, address that. And then the second question of how can we better understand the output of structures as sensors without requiring a huge um, data collection requirement? And to that, we developed the physics guided learning approach. All right. So last but not least, I would like to thank all my students uh, who's been working on this project. It's actually a lot of work and contribution by these students. And I've been taking a lot of credit by just coming out and making presentation. I really appreciate the efforts of the students and the funders and the deployment partners from various entities. And since this is a very interdisciplinary work, we have a lot of collaborators from various departments and also the government and industry sectors. So that's it. Thanks everyone. And let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Ha Jung. It was a very nice presentation. Um, let's give the floor to questions. Let me also. We have a raised hand by Eleni. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Heidi. Uh, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation, actually. I always find Hi, these Eleni. presentations great, very inspiring. Uh, 
Um, I was wondering, since you made the point and showed the examples that now we can use uh, sensing on inanimate objects like structures to understand movements and activity of humans, mm -hmm. is now somehow also an issue being raised as to whether there are um, privacy concerns or special regulations that have to be uh, put in force or considered with these kinds of monitoring activities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the privacy and security issues always come up with it, uh, any kind of human sensing problems, and it is important part of it. So one thing is, I guess we say, that's why we say it's a perceived privacy concerns um, that people have, like we've seen in the elder care that when they have a camera system for monitoring their health status or any uh, critical events like having fall or they have stroke or um, they need an immediate uh, caregiver's response. Uh, we saw that whenever they go to the bathroom, they'll put like a, a towel on top of the camera to make sure that um, the camera is not watching them. Whereas this vibration signal, there's no like a directly like obvious features that people can easily extract out of the data, even if the data gets leaked. So there's a, it feels a lot more comfortable for the people who are using it. So that's a perceived privacy issue. But then of course, if you have these analysis tools um, being used, then it can track your identity and location and even your activity or health status, this can be very sensitive information. So it can still be a concern of uh, privacy and also security uh, issues that can be caused. So we, uh, we are working um, with uh, people who can, who can manage these, um, these security issues and privacy issues better. Um, but on, on the other hand, I think these, these things always go in parallel. Whenever we come up with a way to make the system more secure, there's always people who come up with a new method to break that security. Right. Yes. Yeah, and then when they come up with a way to break the system, and then again, we come up with a way to patch it and then be able to protect. And then once that algorithm is out, and then there's always a hole and then they can, they come up with a way to go around it and attack it. So it, it seems to go in parallel. Um, uh, so I guess we are, it's always a work in progress and we're going towards it. And we know that there's always a hole for, for going towards it. So we, uh, yeah, we, we are working on it, but it's, uh, it's still an unsolved problem. Um, in terms of the policy, yeah, there's IRB and we're going by it to make, to do our best trying mm -hmm. to protect the privacy information and um, like only keep uh, anonymize the data and keep the data within the research group and everything. But technology wise, yeah, it's always a work in progress. Yes, thank you. We, we have a question from uh, Ignacio Robles uh, on whether the structurally formed model transfer is published somewhere or let's say available or accessible. Uh, yeah, we just uh, we had a journal paper published on it, and I'm happy to share share it. If, uh, maybe you can send me an email, or I can. Okay, send... So Ignacio, you can directly contact uh, Hai Jung so that she can give you information. Okay, nice. Mm -hmm. And actually, we also apply the, the model transfer idea to the train or the, the bridge monitoring data as well. And then I think it's going through the final stage of application. So it's not published yet, but it's soon to be coming out. And we have some conference paper on it as well. So I can send that to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, then Armin Dadras would like to have a more, more explanation on slide 19. Okay, slide 19, oh, let me jump to slide 19. Okay, let's see if I can share the screen again. I didn't want to flip through 20 slides with oh, the screen share. Okay. okay. Yeah, this slide. 
Um, okay, so this was a, I, yeah, I rather went through it quickly, but uh, basically summarizing what we've done. Uh, so the track profile feature extraction, so using the feature extraction method we used, uh, because we used the signal, uh, the sparsity approximation, we were able to reduce the dimension of the feature by 100,000 times. I basically got rid of a lot of noise that are irrelevant to the information we want to detect, which is basically detecting the defects on the track and extracted only extracted a lower dimension of feature uh, sensitive to the change in the track condition. So that's what it means by we were able to reduce the feature dimension and I identified the feature that's uh, invariant to vehicle properties and other things that we're not interested in. And then uh, when we put the extracted feature into the classification um, method to identify the damage, we were able to detect the changes in the track. In other words, damage happening to the track with up to 92% accuracy. And then, uh, we were able to correlate the amplitude and the change pattern of this amplitude directly to the severity of the damage happening to the track so, um, because this feature actually had a physical meaning because uh, there's a, a physics or domain knowledge incorporated into designing these features. So using that, we were able to quantify the track change or track damage happening to it. And then the location can be also detected because there's a GPS um, sensor on the train. Uh, all through the physical interpretation of the data we have. Um, finding out the location also has some challenges because GPS has a lot of noise and we did a various signal matching to um, increase the resolution of the location, uh, location information. Uh, and then because we were trying to um, address the problem of this operational condition changes and the train condition changes and being able to detect the damage despite all these conditions. Um, and that, that was the reason why we had to bring in the, the physics guided model. Uh, the end result was robust to different train conditions. So we, we had two different trains um, that were, that were being monitored. And also these trains went through different times and different seasons to experience different operational conditions and train conditions. And we showed that it works uh, well, even if the train condition changes. And, um, and Armin continues work, uh, asking on, on your comment that uh, what was the classification method? Did, did you use supervised or unsupervised learning? Before I give the floor to Christian for his question. Uh -huh. We we developed different kinds. Actually, we did both unsupervised and supervised learning. And we found out that when, when the features design very well, and especially if it's a lower dimensional features, then very simple uh, anomaly detection methods for unsupervised learning was working pretty well. So that was the unsupervised one. And the supervised one is if we want to find like different damage types or do more sophisticated damage diagnosis, then the supervised learning worked very well. Okay. But here the, the main research contribution was on the more like a feature design. So it, it can be combined with basically any kinds of um, classification techniques. Christian, would you like to ask before I, 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 I read the, the question by Ernst? Yes, yes. Uh, I just have a quick question. I actually had two, but I'm just going to ask one uh, for the sake of uh, uh, giving other people the opportunity to ask. Uh, the question is regarding the, the identification technique that you are uh, proposing as a proof of concept uh, identification of, of identity. So uh, I, I assume that you have made experiments using a single person walking and, and trying to identify that. Uh, do you have any advances in, in looking at uh, many people at a, at a room at the same time? Or, or what are your ideas in, in, in this case when mm -hmm. you have like a lot of people there and you want to actually you know, discern whether somebody is there or not? Thank mm -hmm. you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so multiple people identification and localization is something we worked on. And uh, the paper just got accepted last month, actually. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it should be in print. Uh, I believe, I hope. <laughs> uh, so basically, we were able to um, I track and locate and identify multiple people. Uh, we did it up to four people walking together. Uh, so we we can individual individualize the signal, meaning we can decompose the signal into individuals and then match it with identity, and then we can do localization. Um, so that was a, a lot of signal decomposition we had to do. And there we also had to consider the structural effect because many of the decomposition method assumes that your individual signals are uncorrelated or they're independent from each other, which is not true in our case because all of them are structural responses. So they're all correlated through the structural characteristics. So we had to... Um, we had to decompose and come up with a new, uh, again, using the sparsity approximation, come up with a new decomposition method uh, for correlated signals. Uh, and then once it gets decomposed, then it becomes a classification problem of matching the signal to the, the baseline signals we have. Uh, the reason why we uh, went up to four people is actually based on the behavioral science or social science study that when there are a lot of people walking together, they usually break down into smaller groups. The most frequent uh, size of the group was actually two. And then the probability drops when it's three or four people. And beyond four people, probability was very small. So that was just a human behavior model. And that's why we showed up to four people. And then uh, another reason is when there are a lot of people, the, the group size gets big. And they, they can't be all in one point. So they tend to spread out more, uh, which means uh, that if you spread out the sensor, that there's another set of sensors that can detect people uh, closer to that sensor. So it's not like one sensor has to detect and track everyone in the group so they can divide and conquer. Yeah, so that's why we thought, oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, this, this is in line with, with a comment by Ernst Niederleitinger from BAM. Um, uh, he comments that he can see the benefit of diagnosing vehicles by obviously instrumenting sensors on structures, but Regarding humans, wouldn't be much more straightforward and accurate to give, let's say, humans a sensor for, for, for each human, for example, mm -hmm. as an app, app in the phone, instead of track, trying to, let's say, catch the response from distributed mm -hmm. sensors on the building? Wouldn't be, that be more straightforward? Uh, yeah, that will be more straightforward, especially in terms of identification. It's like uh, uh, the RFID that that you have to tag when you enter the building, for example, for the for authenticating authentication purposes. Uh -huh. um, however, there are some applications that it's not possible or it's not desirable. One thing will be if it's in a commercial building and there's a lot of unknown person, unregistered person, like in a shopping mall, you can't require everyone to uh, ha carry a sensor. Or when you carry a sensor, you're assuming that they all have the app installed and it's updated, up to date and everything. So requiring that is not always possible. And especially if you're dealing with patients or children, uh, it gets more difficult. <laughs> Another thing is when we work with uh, hospitals, they, they prefer not to put anything on the patient. Some patients are hard to control. They don't want anything on their body or they, they like to take it out if it's there. Uh, especially for elderly patients also, there's a study that more than 50% of people end up not using anything wearable after a year uh, because it creates some skin problems or they forget to charge. We often give a sensor to Alzheimer patients saying like, only if you remember to charge it and wear it, we, we can we can help you. But uh -huh. these are Alzheimer patients. So may, there are many situations like this. Um, so it's, uh, a, it, and we were worried that it could also interfere with their regular activities. That, like if you have to depend on people uh, for, for collecting the data. Okay, okay, we have, we have several more questions. I will try to quickly wrap up. So Mohammed asks, 
on if you can give some information about the physics guide the physics based feature especially in the case of train track model so how 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 do you incorporate the physics based information i guess mohammed uh, is your question right mm -hmm. okay so how the physics is incorporated i guess one thing is we actually incorporated the um, the train dynamics. So there's a dynamics equation. Uh, we simplified it to single degree of freedom system, but it's actually trying to infer what is the structural parameters of the trains. Like uh, the simplified version will be the mass stiffness damping. What is that? And the, the results you found has to satisfy that, that equation of motion for the train dynamics. And then another physics that we incorporated is that I know the train response gets triggered a lot by these, uh, uh, these different features that exist on the track. And we know that there is a regularly spaced um, joints in between the, the tracks and there's a switch gears and other uh, railway system that naturally exist on the train track. And it will show on the, on the signal responses. So we use those uh, bombs as signature to align the signal. Uh, so basically we have physics-based constraints that has to satisfy the train dynamics and also has to satisfy the feature of the, the railway system. Okay. And then uh, Eve asks that for the structure in Ford model transfer, did you focus on the superstructure or this thing can work also for the surface people on, on which people are working on? Uh, what do you mean by superstructure? I, I guess the, the, the building, the, the surrounding building, if I if understand correct, uh, Eve, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, I mean, is, is it sort of based on the, the frequency content of the building? So somehow the stiffness, uh -huh. the mass and so on, or does it also work for, I don't know, different surfaces like a carpet or a, a more fixed? Um, oh, okay, good carpet. question. Hi, Eve. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, so both actually. So or originally at the beginning, initially we started with this more simple floor structure, like concrete floor. Um, that's flat and homo homogeneous and stuff. And then we move to the carpet. So this system works on carpet. Uh, we do have to change the hardware configuration a bit because in, on a carpet, the signal gets damped a lot quicker. Um, so the sensing range changes. We have to crank up the sensitivity of the sensor a lot to have enough resolution when we uh, measure it. So there's an automatic control loop in there to adapt the hardware configuration based on the floor characteristics and where the person is. If they are far away, then we have to increase the sensitivity. If the person is nearby, we also decrease the sensitivity uh, to change the resolution. But to make sure that signal doesn't saturate. Uh, and then you mentioned the surface, uh, that different surfaces like carpets and wood floor and so on. But we also looked at um, uh, furnitures like on the tabletops or put, it, put the sensor on the shelves to detect human activities. And for hand washing, we put sensor on the sink as well, which will increase the, the sensitivity of the, the signal we're collecting as well. So it, we show that it does work on different kinds of surfaces. Okay, then David asks uh, something about the mass distribution and the mass and the mass load during various circumstances on this, on this train, uh, on this train uh, interaction. And I think I, I, I cannot understand your question correct, David, but he, he has two parts in his question. The first is that if you take the mass distribution and the load distribution and the variability into account during every trip, because we have one of, of the train of the train crossing. And the second is that uh, during a trip, he says that during a trip, a vehicle with convertible mass energy source will also vary over time. Do you, take that into account. David, you may unmute if you want to become more specific, if, if Hayung did not understand the question correctly. Um, let me see if I understood the question. So th there, is this, there is this changing mass during every train crossing. So we have different people. So the mass distribution changes 
the center of gravity changes? I guess that this is the, the mm -hmm. resume of the question. Do you take that into account or it is a black box model that you, okay, yes, this is, this is actually the question. Or, or you, you, this is masked in your lab mass model and your data uh, based identification. Uh -huh. Yeah, so we do consider the mass change and uh, mass change per trip. So in, in the, when the train is running, like let's say we collected one set of data early in the morning when everyone's trying to go to work versus one in the lunchtime, then it's empty, then the mass has changed. That one is considered. So in, in a trip, we look at, we try to infer what the mass is and then adjust according to it or normalize for it. Um, if the question is about like within one train, within one trip, if the distribution is different, like there's another, a lot of people in one car versus less people in the other car, uh, that one's harder and that that one's actually not incorporated. So we're kind of assuming that it's kind of uniformly distributed mass along the train. Um, however, there's actually train try to minimize the differences in train vibration when there are different number of people. Apparently there's a different, uh, there's an air pocket within the train system. It was very interesting to hear them explaining it. So they fill it all with the air when there are more people versus uh, when there's less people, they, they deflate it. So that it's, it's doing some control to the train dynamics to make it not too uncomfortable or not to change too much when there's a variation in the, in the mass distribution in the train. So that, uh, that system kicked in and that's helping with uh, the consistency of the data a bit. Um, but yeah, in, in, the, in our method itself, it is considering uniform distribution within a trip. Okay, okay. I guess we are a little bit off schedule. So if anyone has any more questions, then he can directly contact Hai Jung. Uh, I would like to thank you very much from our side, Hai Jung, and then I will give the floor to Christian to, to conclude. You are muted, Christian. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you for the reminder. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Just a quick reminder of our next uh, presentation that is going to take place a month from now. It's going to be on February 28th. Uh, it's going to be on Monday. Every all, all the presentations are on Monday, actually. And it's going to be uh, presented by, by Professor uh, Yolanda Vidal. Yolanda Vidal is a, I don't know if you guys can see my screen. Hopefully you do. Yes, we can. Uh, yes, this is going to be presented by Professor Yolanda Vidal from the Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, uh, fault detection, fault, fault and damage, damage detection in uh, wind turbines using uh, deep uh, machine deep learning models. So uh, all are welcome to register, to become interested log into our website and, and check it out and we will be happy to have you next month thank you so much on behalf of uh, spoil and eth Zurich, and see you on an upcoming day bye bye thank you very much all thanks again hi you thank you thank hi you. bye thanks great bye. to see you and thanks for bye. inviting me bye bye, bye. Hi, thank you so much